Okay, so as we're picking this up, as I mentioned with the institution of policing and how we're moving from Bacon's that moment from Bacon's Rebellion, and just the what Charles Mills gives us in the racial contract. Um, and what we're thinking about here is we really need to understand kind of that history the, and the, the theoretical and historical fact that is the racial contract, right? And this is his intervention into really that understanding in 19, writing this in 1999, but it's still very prescient in this moment. Because this is what a lot of scholars are building from is Charles Mills. And what he, what he says, what is needed, in other words, is a recogni recognition that racism, or as he argues, global white supremacy is itself a political system. Remember power, politics is power. A particular power structure a former, formal or informal rule, socioeconomic privileges, advantages, and norms for the differential distribution of material wealth and opportunities, benefits, burdens, rights, and duties. So our racialized, class, gendered, um, heteronormative power structure based on our also intersecting with who is able-bodied determines who gets all of these rights, duties, and their place in society. <clears throat> and, I, and I hesitate to use the word determined because I don't want to make it sound as if it is deterministic, if that is our end. No, the opposite. This is precisely what we are doing here and what, it, what social justice intends to do is to remove the, all those barriers to um, create a world where those opportunities are afforded to all. So the racial contract then, this is on page four, is intended as a conceptual bridge between two areas now largely segregated from each other. On the one hand, the world of mainstream, that is white ethics and political philosophy, preoccupied with discussion of justice and rights in the abstract sense. And on the other hand, the world of Native American, African American, and third and fourth world political thought historically focused on issues of conquest, imperialism, colonialism, white settlement, land rights, race and racism, slavery, Jim Crow, reparations, apartheid, cultural authenticity, national identity, indianismo, and Afrocentrism, etc. So those worlds that have forms of knowing, but in Western political thought, we're, we're seen, or in, the, or in the words of Thomas Jefferson, we're seen as inferior beings. We're never thought to have produced anything, right? But yet that is the world that has been covered over. So again, the aim here is not is to adopt a non-ideal contract as rhetorical trope and theoretical method for understanding the inner logic of racial domination and how it structures the polities of the West and elsewhere. And this is very, very powerful in order to conduct an analysis of our world, our moment right now. When you have movements, Black Lives Matter, making uh, demands, demands of what? What type of world are, are we seeking, right? And this is how but first, we need to understand how the world and the injustices were created in the first order before we begin to develop a critique, to enact movements, to enact our agency and build collectivities that will overthrow or abolish those unjust institutions. So the three claims in, the te in this beginning chapter, which is the overview of the entire book, and but we're only reading the overview, is one, it, it's an existential it's existential. White supremacy is both a local and global, exists and has existed for many years. That is the claim. Yes, that's historically pretty accurate. Uh, second, it's conceptual. White supremacy should be thought of as itself a political system. As I stated at the outset, it is about who holds power and how they are able to shape the system, able to shape the social, political, and economic structures of our global political economy. Three, it is methodological. As a political system, white supremacy can illuminatingly be theorized as based on a contract between whites. So therefore, it is clearly a racial contract. In political philosophy, 
the school, uh, there's a tradition of social contract theory, and that's where the racial contract entered as a critique of that social contract that was constructed based on this third, I, this third claim that it was a racialized contract. We don't call it that. We don't call it a white social contract. We call it as the universal, the one that we all are abide by. We consent to be governed. We enter into certain obligations, rights, and duties attributed to the individual. So these are the three claims laid out in the text. So Mills not only seeks out to think theoretically and philosophically, but he's also writing from the empirical world. He's writing from the empirical world as his evidence, as he's building his claim. So he and when he's talking about ontology or social ontology being constructed, which I'm going to show you next, but ontology is again, just to give you the definition, it's a branch of <clears throat> a metaphysics within the the discipline of philosophy that's concerned just simply with the nature and relations of being, being meaning existence, right? So ontology as existence. Um, when Charles Mills discusses, uses the term social ontology, how does one exist in society, right? There is a color-coded mor morality of the racial contract which restricts the possession of this natural freedom and equality to white men by virtue of their complete non-recognition or at best inadequate myopic recognition of the duties of natural law. Non-whites are appropriately relegated to a lower rung on the moral ladder, the great chain of being. They are designated as born unfree and unequal. So a partition social ontology is therefore created, a universe divided between persons and racial subpersons. Think Thomas Jefferson, he is a full person. And how was he thinking about his black slaves or, or blacks in general, right? They were racial subpersons. Black Lives Matter today as a subjective claim into that universal idea of who is a full person. Black lives, the claim is, have never mattered. Empirically, we can verify, oh, yes, that is true. And it is true because we talked about all the laws that were produced to make that true, right? To maintain white supremacy at every institutional level. So uh, this is where they become the subject races, right? Epistemological contract. And I'm going to move through here. Epistemology, knowledge, right? So on matters related to race, the racial contract prescribes for its signatories an inverted epistemology, an epistemology of ignorance. It, an ignorance simply meaning not knowing, right? That's the definition of ignorance, not knowing. It's a particular pattern of localized and global cognitive dysfunctions, which are psycho psychologically and socially functional, producing the ironic outcome that whites will in general be a unable to understand the world they themselves have made. Racism? What are you talking about? Right? All, I see all lives matter. Right? All lives matter. That is precisely what Charles Mills in 1999 was writing here. The claim that we hear today, well, I treat everybody equal. I see the human race. That is precisely the epistemolog epistemology of ignorance that Charles Mills is, is making very clear here. A system that was constructed to maintain that racial hierarchy for people of color faces these forms of discrimination and violence and death. But for the white citizen subject, the full person, they are unable to see it. They are colorblind to the racism and the, the systems that uphold it. So as a general world rule, that white misunderstanding misrepresentation, evasion, we don't want to talk about it, and self-defense deception on matters related to race are among the most pervasive mental phenomena of the past few hundred years. A cognitive and moral economy psychically required for conquest, colonization, and enslavement. And these phenomena are in no way accidental, but prescribed by the terms of the racial contract, which requires a certain schedule of structured blindness and opacities in order to establish and maintain the white polity. So this is the fact. 
that this misunderstanding, this the evasion, this, these justifications of the inferiority of those who would be conquered, those who would be subjugated to the plantation, those who would be relegated to the agricultural fields in California and throughout the country, those who are placed in, in, in harm's way in the meatpacking plants with COVID outbreaks in this pandemic and subjected to sickness and death. We see this pandemic and this dual pandemic of racism and COVID-19 affecting the, the most vulnerable those who are cast out of that white racial, con or I mean the racial contract, our fate, blacks and Latinos are the most uh, affected right now with COVID-19, a number of disproportionate amounts to their population in, um, in this moment. So the racial contract, as you're reading through it, thinking about it, um, and why we're reading it, and I hope that's made clear on why we're reading it in social, social justice because we need that historical understanding the theoretical framework and as we move through each segment of understanding the history and getting through to make sense of our moment so as i want to move through um some of the things and i also had white bylaws recommended reading you can uh, read through that but I will go back to this later. But I wanted to talk about Evelyn, Evelyn Nakano Glenn's uh, Unequal Freedom. Again, this is just a selection from her text. And this is how race and gender shaped American citizenship and labor. So now we're looking at all these concepts and you have the key concept list on how these concepts are defined. How is race defined? We just went over that. Race is, so, is a social political construction. Um, and it's a technology that's used to shape gender and gender. What is gender and what is labor or how it's used to solidify a labor hierarchy, right? We know women get paid less than men for a particular job for the same jobs. Well, women, um, men, a white male, and now you add a black female. There's, there's a cost there that was shaped. In, in the production of labor. So in unequal freedom, um, Nakano Glenn makes claim in a society that proclaims freedom, individualism, and unlimited mobility, the persistent of rampant inequality along ascriptive lines of race and gender seem to be a contradiction. But is it? And this is the claim that I would, the claim that I would also add and argue. This is not a contradiction. On the surface, it seems as a contradiction, but this is precisely how the system was structured. What we are living out today, the claims of inequalities, the mass of uh, people uh, at the border, um, um, entering as laborers, people being uh, even labeled essential workers today. This is precisely part of that legacy of domination over labor, right? So citizenship and labor, privileged white men, and also have been arenas in which groups have contested their exclusion, oppression, and exploitation. So who is a citizen? We go back to 1790. How did that produce outcomes and um, positions in the labor hierarchy? So when we're reading this, and I just wanted to give us an overview, who is the worker citizen? And where does Professor Glenn situate her analysis? Where is citizenship enforced or not enforced? What is race, gender, sexuality, race, race, gender, and sexuality? And in page three that you have, the lower races represented the female types of the human species and females, the lower race of gender. So even as the male was placed in, in, a, in a position I mean, a male of color was placed in an inferior position. And what she's focusing on here, these three groups, Blacks, African-Americans in the South, Mexican-Americans in the Southwest, Asian-Americans in Hawaii, to illustrate how all three regions developed coercive labor systems that relied on racial structures of control. And in all three struggles over labor, citizenship rights were dominant issues that shaped relations among whites and non-white groups. So this is where we begin to think through this book on how these categories have shaped the domination over these groups and labor.